that what I'm about to present to you may not, it, it's not necessarily new ideas or original ideas, but I've sort of pulled together ideas that have influenced me from other great DH minds and others, um, designers into a kind of manifesto, for which I was calling inclusive UX design, then I changed it to DH design, so maybe you can help me come up with what the right terminology and definition should be, because like just about everything I do, this is still a work in process, as am I. So, um, Mina Loy as a model for inclusive DH design. Mina Loy, if you're not familiar with her, was an artist, writer, and entrepreneur who consorted with the major 20th century avant-garde movements, Dada, Futurism, Dada, and Surrealism, yet she was wedded to none. She moved among the major metropolitan centers of modernism, London, Paris, Florence, New York, Berlin, but rarely felt at home. She wrote poems, plays, and pro experimental prose, created drawings, paintings, fashion designs, and constructions. She designed lampshades, toys, Christmas lights, cleaning tools, and corselets. Working across genre and genres and media, Loy defied conventions in a lifelong quest to connect with audiences in more powerful and interactive ways. Her 1914 Aphorisms on Futurism, which is the first futurist manifesto written in English, challenges readers to broaden their horizons and forget that you live in houses, that you may live in your cells. Life is only limited by our prejudices. Destroy them and you cease to be at the mercy of yourself. The future is limitless. Loy's lifelong quest to connect with audiences is in her, evident in her futurist plays from the 19-teens, which will have their world premiere right here at MSU this December. Get your tickets. Uh, we have the um, genius behind that project sitting here in the audience, Alison Dobbins. Um, these plays are ribald, hilarious, outrageous, experimental. They seek to unsettle you and make you laugh and above all make you think. Both a maker and theorist, um, or in DH terms, actually I should leave that slide up so you can jot down all the details. Um, a maker and a theorist, or in DH terms, a hacker and a yacker. Mina Loy would be a model di digital humanist today. But even more so in her drive for innovation and her eagerness to experiment and her engagement with audiences, Loy is a model for DH today because of her poetics of care her interest, concern, and care for the marginalized. Loy's Poetics of Care is perhaps most palpable in her late works. These are constructions that she made out of paper, fabric, metal scraps, and other refuse that she found while living in the Bowery in the 1940s, a Lower East Side neighborhood of New York, also known as Skid Row. These constructions were exhibited this year in the first retrospective of Loy's work at the Bowdoin College Museum of Art. It's an amazing exhibit that's moving to Chicago this spring. And I think Chicago is not that far away, so you should definitely see it, because there's nothing like seeing these in constructions in person. No 2D image can get at the sort of layering and um, dimensionality of the constructions she's made. Until you see them in person, they will make you gasp. Um, <clears throat> so, um, Here's another one called Christ on a Clothesline. As Roger Conover explains, Loy called these constructions refusés, positioning her creations precariously between refused works and works made of refuse. The constructions put marginalized Bowery drillers in the foreground, depicting them with dignity and compassion, but without romanticizing their predicament. As Dawn Ades observes, the attitude toward these ragged outcasts seems forensic rather than pitying. Take, for example, communal cot. Ten sleeping figures on a sidewalk, their anguished faces, weary postures, and ragged clothing modeled in intricate detail. As viewers, we're drawn into intimate proximity with these men, which is definitely true when you see it in person. You just get pulled right in. But at the same time, you're looking down on them as if from above. And this has been hung in both vertically and horizontal, but um, nevertheless, you're still looking down. Scale in communal cot is disconcerting, Aedes points out. The tiny figures are 
seen as if from a height, but the paving stones are huge, out of proportion to the bodies lying on them, so that our distance from the scene is confusing. Loy's composition aims to disturb, to make us alert and uncomfortable with our position. It encourages us to step closer, reconsider social outcasts as human beings worthy of art, and recognize their plight as a communal one. What Roland Barthes calls the punctum, the detail that pricks me, is the bandaged foot on this one figure. There's just so much tenderness there, both in the foot and the rendering of it by Loy. In Loy's artistic designs, form and content synergize to move audiences into proximity with the subject matter. Her work activates awareness and calls us to care. What if we applied such a poetics of care to designs in digital humanities today? So I'm not the first to suggest that we apply poetics of care or care and practices of empathy and care to the digital humanities. Um, Bethany Nowinski, Nowinski argues um, for this in the 2019 debates in digital humanities. There's a whole forum on um, practices of care and empathy. And she calls for a feminist ethic of care, concluding her contribution by saying, let us build platforms that promote an understanding of the temporal vulnerability of the individual person or object that more beautifully express the relationship of parts, one to another and to many a greater whole, and that instill, by cultivating depth of feeling in their users, an ethic of care, active, outward facing, interdisciplinary and expansive, sufficient to our daunting futures and broadened scope. And so today, I'm going to be making the argument that design is a practice of care, and um, focusing particularly on the design of interfaces. So, um, so although design is sometimes treated as an attractive bonus or a final stage in a digital humanities project, um, design is fundamental to digital humanities. And in their 2012 report on the state of the field, Ann Burdick, Joanna Drucker, Peter Lunenfield, Todd Pressner, and Jeffrey Schnapp actually make it a key word for the future of the field. They define design as a creative practice as well as an intellectual me method of thinking through practice. And they assert its importance in all scholarly communication, writing, understanding the rhetoric of design, its persuasive force and central role in the shaping of arguments, is a critical tool for digital work in all disciplines. As a humanities scholar, I think about digital design primarily in terms of the user interface, that point of contact between me as a creator, my work, and my readers. And I need to point out here that the interfaces that I'm gonna show are not all my designs. This one, my sole role is as a ardent admirer of the Taller Electric Marinage project. Um, some I've had a hand in and some I just admire. Uh, the interface is more than an object or a thing, says somebody you know here at MSU, Zachary Kaiser. Um, it is, he calls it a moment in time where creators and users meet and encounter histories, ideas, and assumptions about themselves and about others. And there it's kind of social space, right? So it's a source of ethical imagination that shapes everyday life in ways that are barely perceptible. We don't even notice that we're being influenced by these interfaces, yet they nevertheless establish the contours of your understanding of yourself and therefore of others. Digital platforms open opportunities for designing new interfaces to connect with others and communicate ideas in creative ways. They require attention to design in order to deliver ideas in an increasingly crowded webscape that leaves users distracted, fragmented, and overwhelmed. Anything but a serene experience. Um, to compete with or provide relief from the glut of online information, digital designs need to provide pleasures comp comparable to the quiet satisfaction of reading a good book. I want the interfaces I design to invite readers in, to beguile them with beauty and encourage them to explore as if they were embarking on a journey. Or entering a dwelling that sparks their imagination and kindles curiosity 
offering cozy reading nooks and pathways to the, leading to the woods, up mountains, or to the sea. In fact, it might be more appropriate to call users visitors, temporary dwellers who seek not just knowledge and information, but pleasure. I want visitors to trust the site they've come to, to experience what Mark Slutsky calls good-handedness, that feeling, immediate feeling, on reading the first lines of a book or entering a website that you are in good hands. To build this trust, a digital interface must have strong foundations in coherent style, accurate information, and intelligent ideas. It must be tangibly grounded in the work of scholars who have come before us, those who have inspired and laid the foundations for our work. I want the design to honor my subjects, to respect their integrity, style, and mystery, those realms of privacy and unknowability that no amount of research can lay bare. My thoughts about design have been shaped by Frank Camaro's book, The Shape of Design, which you can access freely online in this beautifully, simply, this beautifully simple digital form. Camaro defines design in terms of um, working toward better futures and connecting with others, terms that reflect a poetics of care. First, he says, design is imagining a future and working toward it with intelligence and cleverness. We use the design to close the gap between the situation we have and the one we desire. Second, design is a practice built on making things for other people. We are all on this road together. Camaro emphasizes the importance of craft and beauty in design, offering the example of the hand axe, the first human-made object. Craft, that careful chiseling of the rock that transforms it into a tool, is what he says links us to a larger tradition of makers. But beauty, that's what makes the hand axe pleasing to hold in your hand long after its usefulness has waned. The highest form of craft, Camaro argues, involves creating something you believe in for someone you care about. In such labors of love, an affection for the audience produces the care necessary to make the work well. We feel the sense of careful craftsmanship in Loy's refugees, which are modeled in intricate detail, each miniature figure, an essential part of a larger composition whose dimensions assume human proportions. These constructions made of dry, curling scraps of paper, crumpled yarn, cloth, and other found materials are, in Comero's words, still warm from the hands of the one who made them. But how can a work of digital scholarship be warm from the hands of those who made it? I think the answer lies in craftsmanship, in attention to the details of design. In digital design, we often speak of whether an interface is user-friendly. But what if we actually thought of our users as friends and designed with genuine care and affection for them? What if, as Camaro said, we crafted our interfaces with enough love that enthusiasm transfers from the maker to the audience that bounds them? Uh, I'm sorry, enthusiasm transfers from the maker to the audience and bonds them, not, bound, not a binding, a bond. <laughs> what if we applied a poetics of care to the design of our DH interfaces? Such approach echoes Kathleen Fitzpatrick's call for generous thinking in the humanities. Her, her definition of generous thinking is as multifaceted as the hand axe. It involves listening to others with care and curiosity, writing in accessible language, freely sharing knowledge, inviting audiences into the conversation, and recognizing them as partners in our projects, as she puts it. Generous, generative modes of critical thinking invite non-experts into the discussion, bringing them along in the process of discovery. Combining a poetics of care with craftsmanship and generous thinking uh, in DH adds up to a set of practices and principles that I'm calling inclusive DH design. Inclusive DH design builds on the larger concept of inclusive design, which considers the full range of human diversity with respect to ability, language, culture, gender, age, and other forms of human difference. 
I'm not the first to suggest um, applying these kind of design principles to digital humanities. In 2012, George Williams asserted that, quote, the digital humanities community should adopt a universal design approach. That is, design focused, quote, not specifically on people with disabilities, but all people. And though I agree with him in principle, I prefer the term inclusive design, which seems less likely to result in design for some presumed norm. I don't think there is a universal design necessarily. And I think the term inclusive design calls for practical attention to who is included in the making and use of our designs, particularly those who can't use, have difficulty with, or have been excluded from existing designs. Inclusive DH design, in my working definition, applies craft, care, craftsmanship, and generous thinking to welcome and engage diverse communities in the production of humanities knowledge. So that's my manifesto. And uh, for the rest of this talk, I'll offer a closer look at several DH projects featured in earlier slides, ones that have contributed to the development of my thinking about inclusive DH design. And a little bit of context is that I teach at Davidson College, which is a small private liberal arts college in North Carolina. Our primary focus is on teaching. Um, and the liberal arts commitment to a broad-based education means that our students, all undergraduates, are more likely to diversify their interests than specialize their, and their commitment to any given topic or project may last only a semester until the next set of courses demands their time and attention. We don't have a beautiful digital humanity center or one at all or a dedicated DH staff or graduate students to help us sustain DH projects over the long term. But we do have DH Davidson domains as you have domains here too, so you know it's really expansive playground for DH experimentation, where I've toyed with platforms like Scalar, Omeka, and WordPress. Um, and WordPress has become sort of my platform of choice, in part because I felt like in those early experiments it gave me the most capacity to experiment with the user interface and apply design principles to that with my limited coding skills. So, and by limited, I mean very limited. Um, so the first one I'll talk about is the Index of Modernist Magazines. This is a database of bibliographic information about little magazines, which are those small, low-budget, often short-lived, and countercultural periodicals that proliferated the beginning of the 20th century. Um, and they were often printed on cheap paper in very small, erratic runs, so they're notoriously difficult to access and classify. I, be, I began this index in 1999, long before I knew anything about inclusive DH designs or even about DH. Um, but nevertheless, and in fact, I credit librarians and our IT people for teaching me about DH and making me understand how my work fit into this new burgeoning field. Um, so even though I didn't have the terms or the knowledge of the field, the project was born out of three inclusive design aims. First, I really wanted to remediate the biases and exclusions of the past and represent the feminist, leftist, and African-American periodicals that had been historically neglected by or excluded from libraries, archives, and um, periodical reference books. They just weren't listed there. Um, also, I wanted to collaborate with undergraduates, librarians, and IT staff as equal partners. And that seems like a no-brainer, but in fact, um, the, sort of at a traditional hierarchical institution, often librarians, undergraduates, and IT staff could be treated as mere research assistants or support staff. And I thought, no, really, these are intellectual partners um, that are essential to this scholarship. And the third one was that I wanted to make the information freely available online in an attractive, intuitively navigable format that also reflected the creativity and diversity of modernist magazines. So this collaborative open access approach was a crucial first step in my thinking about inclusive DH design, a way of breaking down hierarchies of expertise and involving more people as equal partners in humanities research. Since 1999, generations of Davidson College students have contributed to the database as part of a collaborative research seminar I teach on modernism in magazines. And each student works with a librarian to identify a magazine to research and add to the collection. 
So I challenge students to work with librarians to go beyond the celebrated little mag avant-garde little magazines like Blast, The Egoist, and The Little Review, and recover information about more neglected per periodicals like The Anvil, Ch Challenge, Colored American Magazine, The Free Woman, Messenger, and Opportunity. And this research, and this neglect isn't as <laughs> uh, desperate as it was when we began this project, but um, it did seem, but it's still, there's still an imbalance of attention. This research, though, required them also to use microfilm, interlibrary loan, emerging digital archives, and sometimes even travel to other university libraries. And then my students, in turn, challenged me to include popular magazines and pulps like Ranch Romances, which required me to um, search eBay and learn new bidding skills. Um, so the student authored index has grown to include 81 magazines and is used by professors, grad students, undergraduates, um, all around the English speaking world over the years. It's migrated platforms and had several major design overhauls and frequent fallow periods. I've secured um, a couple or three small in-house grants along the way to hire an advanced undergraduate to um, fact check and edit the entries for consistency and accuracy. And in fact, this current interface, which I think is quite beautiful, was designed and created by Peter Bowman, class of 16, and Sabrina Shepard, class of 19, who very gently pointed out to me that the design that I had created was woefully out of date and antiquated. So the Index of Modernist Magazines is a model, I think, for inclusive and sustainable DH projects, precisely because it can be expanded within the course of a semester but also put on hold when I'm not teaching a relevant seminar. And because it's a, not a digital archive, it doesn't require advanced coding or markup skills. Um, and the emphasis on bibliographic scholarship is also, I think, a good starting point for undergraduates. When they create a new entry, it doesn't require sophisticated academic writing, but it does demand careful research, clear, concise prose, and very high level reasoning to um, produce accurate metadata from the messy realm of human creative production. Okay. So my next foray into digital scholarship um, expanded my understanding of inclusive DH design in at least two key ways and lots more too. But first, this was just a bit much bigger project where um, we expanded the collaboration across institutions and outward to the public. And also, we developed a theory and practice of what we called feminist design. So Mina Loy Navigating the Avant-Garde is a peer-reviewed scholarly website that charts Mina Loy's avant-garde migrations and experiments across genre and media. It's, again, not a digital archive, but a curated multimedia interactive platform for accessing and understanding Loy's life and work. It's a cross-institutional collaboration co-created by me, Linda Kinahan at Duquesne University, Susan Rosenbaum at University of Georgia, and a team of undergrads, grad students, librarians, instructional technologists, Loy scholars, an advisory board, and our readers. And we've all been supported by a major NEH Digital Humanities Advancement Grant, which made the collaboration possible. It's built on a WordPress with a custom DH theme that better supports metadata. And um, we argue that Mina Loy navigating the art avant-garde demonstrates how open source digital tools can, trans something you all know, right? That it can transform humanity scholarship from that traditional mode of the lone scholar writing a monograph to a cross-institutional team working in collaboration with our readers on a multi-graft, an interactive, multi-authored, multimodal resource. The site, some of the things it includes, it provides digital narratives and visualizations that contextualize and interpret Loy's writing, art, and related artifacts. It includes timelines, maps, art exhibits, a twine game, close readings that interlet texts with their interpretations, and student-authored biographies of figures in Loy's network, which we also use to generate a network visualization. Um, student DH projects are grouped together under new frequencies, and there's Amina Loy Bedeker, which is a digital scholarly book by Linda, Susan, and I that charts Loy's uh, shifting relationship to futurism, Dada, and surrealism. 
When we began this project in 2014, we weren't thinking about inclusive DH design per se. Instead, we developed the principles of feminist design. To give design its due is a feminist act, we declared. It involves recognizing readers as vital partners in the scholarly endeavor and embracing style and aesthetics as crucial to the work of digital humanities. It's not just about making websites look pretty, but about considering the audience's needs and interests, meeting them where they are, and inviting them to participate in humanities research. Feminist design also entails rethinking the processes of generating and disseminating knowledge. We incorporated our principles of feminist design into our project manifesto, where we stated this definition, feminist design means breaking down hierarchies, fostering open exchanges of expertise, reflecting artistic diversity, embracing style and aesthetics as crucial to digital humanities, rather than insufficiently techie or rigorous. We were aiming for a user experience that is immersive. We hope you, are, as visitors, are drawn into the design and generative. We hope you are stimulated to respond in kind. We actually shared our digital humanities custom theme um, with anybody who wanted to adapt it, but unfortunately, it's already no longer compatible with current PHP. Um, so uh, true to modernist manifesto form, we played with font size and layout to try to create a synergy between form and content, but we didn't assume that our readers who came to the site would know what the modernist manifesto form was. So instead, we invited them into understanding by adding this button that says, why is this page written this way? And if you click on it, you can get a description that it tells you the history of the Modernist Manifesto and invites you into understanding in that way. So by meeting readers where they are, we incorporate our principles of feminist design into the manifesto's interface and into the interface of the site more generally. Feminist design is the rejection of an artificial binary between utility and ornament, says Whitney Tretian, and we took these words to heart. We wanted to beguile our readers with beauty, as Loy does in her work, recognizing that form and aesthetics are integral to communicating ideas and connecting with readers. And we designed the interface to reflect Loy's style, aesthetics, preferred color pa palette, and feminist practices. Our site logo visually echoes Loy's signature, and we, just, we wanted to evoke, she had this peripatetic lifestyle, always moving from city to city, and so to invoke those movements, we sampled the feet from this Clara um, Tice drawing, Virgins Minus ver Verse, which appeared alongside Loy's poem, Virgins Plus Curtains Minus Dots, in, I think it was a 1914 or 15 issue of the little magazine Rogue. And um, so we not only, we took those feet to show the, the sense of dance and movement, but also the, um, in this way, the logo gestures toward feminist collaboration in the avant-garde. We adapted a parallax theme to draw readers into Loy's world. And I'm sorry, it doesn't really look good in a screenshot, but I was worried about page loading being too slow. So I tried to just give a sense of the parallax um, <clears throat> scroll here. Um, and we were trying to create this illusion of depth and mo motion. Andrew Reichard, class of 17, who was the pioneering undergraduate project partner. Um, I love this little detail, which I put at the top of this slide. You see the little shadow line under the main menu? That was his, um, he insisted on that detail. And it's subtle, but I think it gives you that sense of depth right from the beginning. It's one of those details that you're not really aware of, but do give you a sense of entering some other kind of space. Um, he was intrepid, creative, and technologically savvy, and he also gave us the motto, it's doable, whenever we came up with an outlandish idea, which was frequently. IT fellow Olivia Booker, who had graduated from Davidson and stayed on as a fellow for a year, used her Photoshop skills and artistic eye to help create these palimpsests that layer Loy's portraits over fold-out maps from the Bedeckers, the travel guides she used to navigate her way through Florence, New York, and Paris a century ago. And we embedded these kind of interactive carousels using a free plugin to encourage readers to explore Loy's art. We inserted buttons to key destinations and created multiple pathways for navigating the site, depending on readers' interests. 
We also, this, this thing at the top was actually a pricing index that was, the theme was designed for an e-commerce site. So we, um, we, uh, oh, okay, uh, yeah, we repurposed it from the e-commerce theme to display almost all the available resources on one menu. And a really important detail here is that student research projects are featured front and center under new, res new frequencies. They're granted equal pro prominence as our peer-reviewed scholarly book for digital travelers, the Mina Loy Bedeker. And both, when you get to their pages, they're displayed in similar grids that allow users to not just, they don't have to go through in a linear way, but they can select topics based on their own areas of interest. As we developed the project, we also learned about web accessibility using alt text, color contrast, and a WP accessibility plugin to make it possible for readers to toggle for high contrast and larger font size. A related experiment in feminist design was our effort to expand our collaboration and invite readers to participate in a digital flash mob formation of, the, um, of a feminist theory of the avant-garde. This experiment was born out of frustration with existing theories of the avant-garde, which we felt were just inadequate for the, to account for the work of Loy and others whose modes of experimentation just didn't conform to this marshalized oppositional stance that's associated with the historical avant-garde, like the futurists and um, the Dada um, folks. So we wanted a, a more capacious theory, and so we decided to invent one. Why not? It's doable. Um, and we seized on a suggestion by Nancy Selleck, who's actually an early modern theater and performance professor who had a previous career as a professional ballet dancer. And we proposed an alternative term for these outsider artists, the Andor Guard. In ballet, Andor means turn, a turn toward the outside. It's a circular turn away from the center, yet with an eye toward the center. And upon return, the center is adjusted, reformed, transformed by the arc of revolution. This way of turning, revolution as a circular motion rather than as a violent overthrow, seemed to better describe the, the movements of women, BIPOC, queer, and disabled artists of the early 20th century. Because rather than assuming this martial stance at the forefront of culture, these artists often came from the outside and circulated on the margins. They rarely enjoyed the power or privilege or authority derived from membership in institutions of the art. And they weren't even acknowledged as leaders or key figures in the oppositional avant-garde um, groups that challenged these institutions. Instead, they moved, they worked and moved strategically around the margins to transform the gendered, racialized literary traditions and visual cultures that excluded or in objectified it them. But we didn't want to just propose a new theory of the underguard. Um, we wanted to do, generate theory in a new collaborative way, a method that was informed by our principles of feminist design and enabled by digital tools. So we devised an experiment, a digital flash mob. We invited our readers to think with us and join in the work of reimagining the historical avant-garde as a more inclusive underguard. In the summer of 2018, undergrads Leah Mel and Mahalia Cooks helped us orchestrate this digital flash mob using social media to invite scholars, students, artists, writers, interested public, anybody we could get to submit digital postcards expressing their ideas about the Andor Guard. And this is what the submission form looked like online. They could sign their names, adopt pseudonyms, or remain anonymous. Um, and no prerequisites or qualifications were required. You could see that the submission type could be text, an image, it could be video, audio, interactive media, whatever they chose to do. So um, <clears throat> the digital flash mob generated a sense of community engaged in an inclusive scholarly project, engaged in creative and intellectual thinking together. We received over 70 postcards which are displayed in a grid, so every time you load this page, they appear in a different order. And users can select them by clicking the little button in the corner. They can select the postcards they're most interested in, arrange them in the light box, and, um, and in that way compile their own customized theory of the avant-garde, which they can then export in a PDF. 
So in this way, even though the flash mob is over, we're not still accepting submissions. Um, it's, readers can still participate in the ongoing formation of their own custom theory of the Andor Guard. Um, and so theory is activated as a plural, elastic, collaborative, and ongoing process. Um, another interesting thing about this was that very few of these postcards represented theory as we know it. There weren't a lot of text. Most, uh, the biggest, most popular form was collage. It was like, and even though a lot of the people submitting them were scholars, it's like everybody just wanted a chance to be creative, to participate in creative ways and think about new forms of um, expressing these new ideas. So the flash mob um, was a time-limited experience in um, feminist design. But the Mina Loy website continues to foster community, connecting us to Loy scholars and enthusiasts in the US, UK, and Europe. Our feminist design isn't just user-friendly. It welcomes users into, or visitors, into a community of care, care about Mina Loy and also about each other. And some of our visitors, um, some of our visitors have actually become friends and collaborators um, who have extended invitations to us. So, for example, the owner of Mabel Dodge Lua's Via Coronia in Florence, Italy, found the site and invited us for a private tour of the estate, which is pretty amazing. Um, Allison Dobbins invited me to join a group of theater professionals here to stage the world premiere of um, Loy's plays. Linda Susan and I were invited to the opening events for the Mina Loy retrospective at Bowdoin. Susan gave a keynote at a Mina Loy conference in Paris, and the three of us gave a collaborative keynote at a digital symposium on Loy studies organized this summer. It was organized by early career scholars, Jade French, Jennifer Ashby, and Julia Heinemann. And that was really great to feel like we were connecting a, you know, with early career scholars, because the three of us are a little bit long in the tooth. And one of the proudest moments for me occurred when we were in a Zoom planning session with these young scholars. And one of them said that our website was the first thing that gave her a sense of community. And I was just like, oh my gosh, the crown of all my wishes. You know, this is a dream come true. This is exactly what I would have wanted our feminist designs to accomplish a sense of community for people new to Loy and Loy scholarship. Um, so we celebrate this sense of community, but we're also conscious of the limitations of our feminist designs. Our members of the Mina Loy community are mostly white, mostly women, mostly academics. Uh, to encounter the history of avant-garde poetry is to encounter a racist tradition, writes Kathy Park Hong, pointing out that from its early 20th century inception to some of its current strains, American avant-garde poetry has been overwhelmingly white enterprise. Despite our feminist designs to generate a more inclusive theory of the Andor Guard, we're still involved in an overwhelmingly white enterprise, which raises the question, how can we build on principles of feminist design to develop more inclusive DH design practices that diversify our communities of care? So here I want to take a brief detour from my own projects to mention a website that is, for me, a model of inclusive DH design, the Colored Conventions Project. Co-founded by Gabriel Foreman and Jim Casey, the project is one of the flagship projects coming out of Penn State University's Center for Black Digital Research. Um, and I just want to highlight, I think one of the people, no, that's the taller Marinage was here, but has moved on. Um, I'm just going to highlight a few of the ways that it models inclusive design and, of course, focusing on the interface. So the interface invites you in as a visitor with this image that they've chosen for the, the landing page, uh, a large 19th century pen and ink sketch of a meeting hall full of well-dressed black women and men. And we come in and see the crowd from behind as if we've entered the hall and are just waiting for the family on the, in the back there to get seated so that we can move inside. Um, the illustration also aligns our focal point with that center aisle, guiding our eyes through the crowd to the front of the hall and beckoning us thereby to proceed back in time to participate in history. And so they've just carefully chosen this illustration to enact the overlying text, which says bringing 19th century black organizing to digital life. The menu-driven structure gives users access to most of the content in a single click, 
and the primary menu offers multiple possibilities for users to participate. The first item, conventions, welcomes users at various levels of expertise, including options to learn about the um, conventions, explore digital records, or submit records. So these in choices invite users to see themselves as fellow historians and scholars with opportunities to learn, contribute to research, and join in the process of telling stories and developing new historical knowledge. The About CCP offerings both describe and enact the pr project's commitments to diversity, inclusion, and collective organizing principles and values. The featured images exhibits also uphold the principles that colored conventions were produced through collectives rather than the work of singular figures or events. And so every exhibit features these photographs. Notice how they'll pair one or they'll have a group of people in the drawing where there are usually, there are multiple people, there are often men and women in these images. And the titles of the exhibits are also theme and movement focused. The meeting that launched a movement, the fight for black mobility, and these themes connect black history to current events that are highlighted in the news section beneath the exhibits, which encourages users to mobilize now for a future where black lives matter. So in these and other way, ways, the Color Convention Project invites readers to participate in humanities research and recognize its relevance to their lives. I'll talk briefly now about two current projects that are much smaller in scale than those I've outlined so far but both are motivated by a commitment to what I'm now calling inclusive DH design. Envisioning the Harlem Renaissance is a website that presents scenes from the life and work of Gwendolyn Bennett. She's an important but relatively neglected black women writer and artist of the Harlem Renaissance. In the 1920s, she was a rising star. At only age 22, she debuted and gave the, the final poem at the famous Civic Club dinner that some people think is the inaugural moment of the Harlem Renaissance, um, <clears throat> even though, of course, it's, it started much earlier. Um, that event was sort of a signature event. Um, she published cover art and poetry in Opportunity, Crisis, and Fire, and won a prestigious sorority scholarship to study art in Paris for a year. But she faded out of the spotlight in the 1930s. Her art was inhibited by financial struggles, marital woes, uh, a family crisis, and also harassment from the KKK and the FBI. So the, uh, the website tries to uh, um, doc document her pivotal role in the Harlem Renaissance by creating a series of scenes that illuminate significant moments in her life, art, poetry, and other writings. And this scenic structure is deliberate. It's designed to reflect the fragmentary nature of her corpus. Much of her work was lost or burned or left unfinished because she had so many other competing pressures for her time and attention. And there are also big gaps in her life story, portions of which were too painful for her to discuss or write about. So the site interface seeks to welcome general readers as well as scholars, establishing Bennett's relevance to today by linking her to Amanda Gorman, who also did an inaugural poem at age 22, um, and drawing parallels between the black periodicals then and social media today. And readers can choose which scenes they're interested in as if, I think these kind of look like Polaroids, you know, so you can pick the Polaroid and then dive into the story behind the images. And though it's on a, a much smaller scale, Collaboration is still essential, and my most important partnership has been with Dr. Sandra, Sandra Govan, whose 1980 dissertation on Bennett rescued her from near oblivion, and it remains, I think, the single most important study of Bennett today. Serendipitously, Sandy is a professor emeritus at UNC Charlotte, like 45 minutes away from me, um, and she's generously shared her research and granted me permission to share her dissertation on this site with others and also share a video recording of an interview I conducted with her about her research. That's all forthcoming. The site is very much a work in progress and there's so much more I'd like to do, such as interviewing Bennett's surviving family members, what my colleague Hillary Green calls, um, who my colleague, colleague Hillary Green calls kinskeepers, and I'd also like to incorporate student work. So one way I plan to incorporate student research is with a new open access tool we're developing at Davidson called Scrolly Teller. This tool was inspired by the New York Times Close, Reading, Close Read series. And when I landed on this one, their close reading of Elizabeth Bishop's poem, One Art, I just 
gasped with delight. I was like, uh, this is amazing. This is it. This is what I've been looking for, a close reading tool that shows the text highlighted alongside with its interpretation in this interlinked, interactive way. Um, we had tried to develop, we developed a plugin for close side-by-side -side close reading for the Mina Loy website, but it was neither beautiful nor intuitive to navigate as this is. So I saw this and I reached out to John Michael Murphy, who's a Davidson alum, who is now a graphics developer at the New York Times, and I'm like, John Michael, how did they do this? It's amazing, can we do anything like that? And he explained that they were calling it a Zumi poem and said it was created on Google Docs. And he offered to collaborate to develop a simplified open source version for educational purposes using non-proprietary code. So our, our collaboration was supported by Davidson College's digital learning team with Murphy coding the tool and me consulting on the design and, and some practical issues of, you know, a, as a teaching tool. So it's still, we're still putting finishing touches on it, but I would say that it's already a beautiful, nimble DH tool for small projects that supports teaching of core humanities skills like close reading, evidence-based analysis, and concise writing. And it displays text alongside interpretations in a visually engaging scrolling narrative. We had to let go of the Zoom function because it was just gonna be too complicated for users to be able to encode that. But you can still approximate the Zoom um, function by making your text larger or um, like zooming in on parts of an image and making a larger a, a detail of an image on the next slide. So there's other scrolling tools out there but, and other apps for digital storytelling, but this one differs from um, a lot of existing tools in that it's designed for teaching and learning in the humanities. It supports text, image, audio, and video. It permits readers to assemble annotations into a narrative arc and generates web accessible stories from a Google Docs template. Finally, it requires no downloading and minimal server space. It's designed for people who want to create digital stories without acquiring advanced technical skills. The scrolly teller stories are generated from a um, simple Google Docs template. Well, sort of simple, but this is a portion of that template, which contains self-explanatory instructions. And then what happens is creators will um, go to the launch page, make a copy of the template, and publish their doc to the web, and then um, adapt it with their own content and then paste the link back into this scrolly teller launch page, which generates a URL for displaying the story. This really, really requires only a single class period for training and responds to DH calls for minimalist computing to reduce the hidden environmental costs of content management systems without demanding the technical or emotional labor of static site generation tools. Um, this is something Quinn Dombrowski talks about. Um, because the displays are generated on the reader's browsers, the app can be stored on a static file server where it requires less space than a small JPEG. Um, so I've been testing the tool with students in my word art classes and um, for an assignment that um, asked them to close read a poem from one big self. This is a documentary collaboration between the poet C.D. Wright and the photographer Deborah Luster who visited together several Louisiana prisoners and prisons and photographed and interviewed the incarcerated people there. Um, and so the students chose a poem from this collection, but they had to incorporate one of Luster's images into their analysis, their close reading of the poem. And then they had to do a reflection on what it meant to them, their process of using this new tool. And their reflections, I think, are particularly instructive. For me, they illuminated dimensions of inclusive DH design, some of which I hadn't even anticipated. So I'm gonna share just a few anonymously and with the student's permission. So this student attests to the value for close reading. Writing and utilizing and exploring this tool, I've honed my close reading skills and learned to analyze in a more creative and introspective manner. While I've annotated countless texts throughout my life, this was a new experience in that I was engaging in analysis on a molecular level, and given the nature of the poem, a personal level. So not just close reading more carefully, but more in a more personally engaged, careful way. Another student talks about its effect on their writing. I found that less words were better. This was a student who, <laughs> I've even edited this down. 
definitely needs the practice in concise writing, but um, found it helpful. I found that less words were better for aesthetic purposes and legibility reasons. Writing my thoughts in scrolly teller format slowed down my thoughts, allowing them to fully develop. It also enabled me to be more concise with my thoughts since I was limited in the number of words I used for each slide. Um, this was a more surprising insight um, from a student who wrote, I have pretty severe ADHD and would consider myself a visual learner. As a reader, having a split screen with added context really appeals to me. I can easily get lost in dense chunks of text, but the added context helps me create associations in my brain that allow me to better retain the information. And this last comment comes from a student whose father has been incarcerated since she was a baby. So the project had really deep personal resonance for her. Initially, she writes, the complexity halted me. How would I formulate my entire mind's process in five to 10 slides? How would I help my readers understand concepts I was only beginning to understand? Within the Scrolly Teller program, I expanded on theories created in payphone conversations I shared with my father as a child. I could finally shatter the glass, protecting a system that had destroyed so many lives around me. The most inviting part of academia is when you are growing as a person because you care enough to stop and connect with the resources and texts accessible to you. If not for that, why would we be here at all? I am here because I can write stories that I never told, that my family never felt safe enough to say. If the Scrolly Teller platform can supply me with that, what else could I ask for? By encouraging students to take intellectual risks, read closely, slow down, measure their words, contextualize their analysis, and connect personally with the material and their readers, Scrolly Teller activates inclusive DH design principles and provides a new platform for practicing a poetics of care. As I suggested at the beginning of my talk, Loy's Poetics of Care made her an inclusive designer long before the term had any currency. Her late works, begun while she was living among the unemployed, destitute, and outcast in the Bowery, best demonstrate her poetics of care. She takes the Dada notion of the artist as collector and out of her found objects designs these three-dimensional artworks that challenge readers to see, to read and see refuse and the refused in new ways. She gives dignity and humanity to those who have been denied it, making them not objects of her art, but fellow subjects. In this untitled work, an older woman, who actually bears a very striking resemblance to Loy herself, looks up at the face of a taller man whose stooped posture and lined face betray accumulated pain and suffering. He looks aside, perhaps out of sorrow or shame. She stares intently at his face, her dark eyes directing our attention toward his watery blue eyes, as if, if we look closely enough, we might connect. A pole separates them and divides the composition. A pattern of bricks behind them suggests a wall. But the pole could also represent an interface, a point of contact. The man's head leans toward her as if on the verge of touch. The tactile qualities of the crumpled fabric, the tangled yarn hair, and the curling paper brings these figures to life, putting them in active relationship not only with each other, but with us as viewers. Mina Loy is a model for DH today. Her work reminds us that beauty and design can evoke deep thought and feeling, foster a sense of community, and bring us together in the shared imaginative enterprise of the humanities. And in the interest of sharing our work, I've created a scrolly teller version of the presentation I just gave you. So you can access it from this QR code, and I'll come back to the QR code in just a minute, but um, when you look at it, your cell phone, you're going to see the, the annotations glide over the slide. But I actually prefer the side-by-side -side display, which might load in a minute. Um, I'll show you that in a minute. I don't know why it's not loading. But um, go ahead if you want. You can Let's see. This. There it is. So this is how Scrolly Teller works in action. You scroll down, and the slides interact with the text as it appears. 
Um, there you go. Uh, so now I'll go back to this, and I would very happily take any questions or comments.